Dan Lund and David Joyce, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. Dan, it's not been too long since you came on, but Joyce, it's been a couple of years, so delighted to have you both. Thank you, mate. Good on you, Dan, Dan, I'm going to come to you first. Anyone that doesn't know who you are, a very brief introduction. Um, if they want a longer one, they can go back to the one we did uh, together. But uh, yeah, brief introduction from you, Dan, then over to you, Joycey. Sure, no worries. So my name's Dan. I'm uh, Head of Performance Science and Medicine at the LTA, which is a governing body of tennis in the UK. Um, been in a role for about five years now. In a former life, I was a physio, uh, working mainly in rugby. So worked for England rugby for a number of years and club rugby. Uh, and I guess behind all of that, very fortunate to be a husband and um, father of two girls, nine and seven, and uh, live in the middle of Leicestershire. And my name's David. Most people in sport would know me as um, Joycey. And very similar story to, to Dan. I started off as a physio, spent the best, well, the, probably the last 13, 14 years as a performance director uh, and now run a sports strategy and decision-making consultancy called Synapsing, live in Sydney with uh, my wife and uh, daughter Matilda and son Rory. Lovely. So where did you take to meet? <clears throat> uh, who's, who's fielding this one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to chuck it out there and see what comes back. <laughs> Dan was dancing at a bar that I went to. Nice. Um, <laughs> no, we, we're actually, we're, we're both on a course together in Nottingham. Um, geez, that's, it's going on for fifth, no, no, geez, almost 20 18, years ago. 18, 19 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was working at Saracens at the time and, and Dan was at Northampton Saints and um, realised we both hated the same things and and um <laughs> and that was that was basically it and then we, we've as i said we've we've had a remarkably similar journey in that we we both did our physio degree both did our physio master's degree both did our our strength and conditioning master's degree and and obviously have have been i've been lucky enough to um work on a couple of books with him so um it's been been a, a long relationship most people get less for murder <laughs> let's dive into the book because that's obviously people will know you as practitioners in your own right but people will know the book of high, high performance training for sports so i remember speaking to you joyce when the first one came out so it's great to get you on to see and understand the journey of the of the second one so was the second one always in the pipeline um i think early on rob um we, we saw that the first edition had really struck a chord. So there was a, there was a clear value proposition for it. Um, and we were lucky enough to, you know, speak at conferences around the world and people kept talking about how, how much they really enjoyed high performance training for sports. Um, not just for the fact that it was encompassing a lot of issues. I think it was just the way it was written and people felt that they were getting amazing content from people that, um, they would have to spend hundreds upon hundreds of pounds or dollars to get to a conference. So I think when we started to see the traction, we thought that this might be something that would have a bit of a life um, going on. And, and that's certainly how it seems to have, have panned out. So Dan, what's the new edition? Cause it's not a typical, just a second edition. Like there's loads of new stuff in there. Yeah. So I guess there's, there's a bunch of new content. So, I mean, <clears throat> off the top of my head, there's seven or eight completely new chapters. Um, there's certainly more than 75% new material in terms of kind of revamp and refresh of ideas. Um, but I guess when you step back a bit further, and I guess it's probably reflective of, you know, Dave, Dave and my, you know, growth and um, evolution over the last few years and just the changing kind of landscape of sport. But there's a lot more about the how. So kind of working at the kind of player, coach, player, practitioner, coach, practitioner interface, that kind of space. So... Um, just from my own personal perspective, there's stuff in there around learning environments, learning strategies, coaching and cueing and the use of language, um, creating high performing environments to work in. There's some really good stuff around holistic support. And I guess, again, reflective of the world we now live in um, and some of the complexities and stresses of being in sport as a practitioner or as an athlete. Um, quite a lot of work around well-being, which is 
from a personal point of view, is a fantastic chapter, which you know I really enjoyed reading, um, let alone working on with with the guy. So, um, and then there's some work around, yeah, again translating um, high quality S and C into performance, you know, on the field, on the court, into play. So I think they're the they're the big things that change um, for me. I actually did a survey, and I've told you, well, I think I told you guys about this, about people that have been on the podcast and asked them their top five strength and conditioning books and top five non-strength and conditioning books. And High Performance Training for Sports came out number one as podcast guest, uh, number one, obviously, strength and conditioning book. So there you go. I did tell you that, didn't I? I hope I, I don't did. Know, I don't know. You told me yeah. that. Uh, yeah, well, there you go. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's um, that was great. Um, so yeah, we're good. We'll, because you said you guys have had very similar journeys, I'd like to dive in before we dive into your chapter that you wrote together. Have a little chat around probably both your transitions away from directly athlete facing roles into more leadership. And I'll come to you, uh, you first, Joycey. What was the point? that you wanted to, or you felt you wanted to and needed to move into that leadership position? And what kind of things did you do to actually make that happen? The reason I ask that is because it seems a natural progression for people to want to move into the leadership, a more leadership management role. And I think even now more than ever that people have got access to business style leadership books that have been quite all the rage um, for these last five or six years. So your, what's your journey into less athlete-facing roles and more leadership? I guess, Rob, for me, it was about impact and, and scaling of impact. And as a physio, you, you have impact on an individual basis, which is magnificent. And, it, and it's, it's really, really great. But what I realized that from that perspective, you, it was actually a, a small aspect of, of what um, performance was and and certainly for me and I, I won't speak for Dan but certainly for me I found that adding the strength and conditioning bow to my um, uh, to my skill set really enabled me to see a number of different areas of the performance puzzle and 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 as soon as that happened as soon as I could have conversations in different languages I think what ended up inevitably happening was that you're bringing groups of people together and that, and that's ultimately what leadership is. And if you've got a, a bit of a, a vision and, and a mission and you can bring people along the journey with you, that kind of takes care of itself. And, um, and I, I started to really enjoy that aspect of it and, and having scaled impact. So it was not just with an individual, but it was with a team and, and I guess for me, the things that I have seen about myself in the last, I don't know, probably five or six years is that um, I've always been, like working in full-time sport is really challenging. But the sort of challenges I was seeing were starting to rhyme with each other, you know, and and what I wanted to do was to really scare myself. So that's why I stepped away and, and did a full-time MBA. And, and I'm now working in areas where uh, I, I'm a, a, a real novice and, and having to be the, um, the, the white belt, so to speak. And, and I actually really, 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 really love that. So, um, and it's, it's completely congruent with what Dan and I have tried to do with, with all our projects really is to, is to try and bring people together and enhance the system as a result of knowledge from various different areas. We'll come back in a minute and, and have a little chat around the impact that people in sport can have outside of sport, which they probably don't really think about. But I'll come to you, Dan, on that same transition question as um, as Joycey. What was your reason? I mean, we spoke about it when we uh, did the podcast together, but what was your reasons for wanting to develop into that leadership management role and again that may seem quite an obvious thing that people want to do but I spoke to Joe Club not too long ago and she was openly saying I didn't want to do that like I wanted to be face front facing with athletes I didn't want to do the traditional you know head of director of because I wanted to be there with the athletes so just wanted to get your perspective on and your journey yeah so I think a bit like Joycey you know there's um and as I said before, that there is a ceiling to your own impact um, working as a, a player-facing practitioner. 
Um, and I think the other thing for me, if I'm being really honest, is I'd, I'd been in rugby for 13 or 14 years. And it's, as, as Dave said, it's, it's cold face stuff. It's, it's high pressured. It's nonstop. Um, but it does get a bit samey, you know, and if, if I'm really honest with myself, the, and I'm happy now to say because I'm in a different role, but the last couple of years, you know, working with England was, were very exciting, hugely honoured to have the role. But I could see myself becoming, you know, over time, less enthused um, and less excited by the challenges because they were they were familiar. You know, they, there was this kind of cycle to to that system. Um, and I think inevitably, you know, as, as all of us approach midlife, which I'm now squarely sitting in the middle of, um, <laughs> there, there is a thing around a growing sense of self-awareness and a sense of, you know, altruistic um, desire to help others bring people together and, and connect the dots. And a bit like Joyce said, I think a lot of our motivations for the first book was around seeing the impact that an integrated model of performance development could have over a player, over a team. Um, and I think exactly the same as a practitioner working on, on the front line for a long period of time, you, you can see the impact you could have working across people, across functions to then obviously elevate performance and longevity in, in your players. So a bit, a bit of those things for me, really, really lucky when the opportunity came up for me because I wasn't looking and it kind of it came. But it came at a time where I thought, yeah, this is this is the right time for me. <clears throat> now, if you ask me two years in. I'd have gone, shit, I wish I was still um, a practitioner, <laughs> you know, because it definitely is a trial by fire and a very different um, working environment. Um, but no, thoroughly enjoy it. Glad I did it. I've done a couple of surveys over these last few months, one in British football, one in rugby league, which spanned England and Australia, and then a rugby union one, which was UK wide, and then New Zealand and Australia. And one thing that is a simple question but how old people are who are in the roles of assistants regular senior lead uh, head of director of and i think across the three surveys the average ages were potentially 34 35 maybe 35 so you look at it instantly and go we've got a very young workforce in the kind of roles that potentially you have or used to have is all the things that you mentioned just there, Dan, potentially a reason for that, that people are getting to that stage where you've got and thankfully made the transition, but maybe others haven't and have taken the step to go, I think I've had enough. What else is there out there? And potentially transitioning away from elite sport. Do you think that's a genuine path which could explain the average ages of that industry? I think so yeah I mean I can only speak for my own my own experiences but I guess I, I spent the first decade of being a being a physio trying to be really good at what I was doing and it was all about that it was quite tunnel visioned about as Joyce said layering on some qualifications and getting experience understanding that S&C interface and, and working in that kind of space um, but I guess um, o- over time the intensity of that work and the focus of that work certainly for me, it does start to, to shift and your priorities change, personal circumstances change. Um, and there's no doubt, I mean, again, Joyce can speak to this far more than I, that, that there, there is a method out of or a, a transition out of sport potentially for for people. There are skills which do cross that divide into kind of um, the more corporate space. Um, equally, there are those people like Joe perhaps who, you know, are exceptional practitioners who can redefine their environment or the way in which they work or the skills that they bring and, and perhaps have more longevity i don't know i think it it's very much an individual journey this isn't it mm. what do you think about that jc yeah i i th- i'm really similar to dan in that i i think it it gets certainly for me it gets down to um how different your environment is even if you can be in one club or one organization and you know what what you're doing from year one to year ten are poles apart, and you know the the context and the environment changes that much. So you're constantly being um, given new opportunities to learn, and and ultimately most people enter into our sort of profession because they're learners. Um, if you're in if your context or your environment doesn't change, or if you're doing the same job at a different organisation. It does get a little bit samey, I reckon. 
And that's why there's there's constantly people trying to push to get to the next level because there are new aspects of that role. Um, but there is there's clearly a ceiling that that Dan alluded to as well, where you um, you know you that there's not that many people from our field that go on to become general managers. Um, so it's either you've hit the ceiling or you go out. Um, and there's probably an attrition past that sort of 40 year age, 40 years of age to people that go on and go, well, I'm interested in seeing what else life has got to give if they can't shape their environment that they're in. Um, particularly in the athlete facing roles, I reckon. And, and it is really hard as we can both to, att- we, as we can both attest, uh, it's really hard with a young family. So it makes sense that that's kind of that pivot point that you're talking around um, that 34, 35 has been the head of, and I imagine there's a bit of churn in the 40s. So why the MBA for you? I have looked at it for years, Rob. Um, I remember when I was working at Blackburn Rovers, I was I went on to information information nights at the University of Manchester and um, London Business School, and so I've always had this interest in it. Um, and I'm a, I'm an inquisitive soul um, by nature, and what I wanted to do was actually explore what else is around in life. And I started doing it part time as a as a way of firing a, a a bullet before a cannonball, so to speak, just to try it and go. Oh, yeah, actually, I do like this. Um, and as I said earlier about being a white belt, and I actually really like that. I I wanted to scare the hell out of myself, and I'm having conversations with with people about you know, financial models and marketing strategy. And I've never thought about this sort of stuff. And I was just by so far the novice. And I loved it because the thing I know about myself, Rob, is that I get exhilarated by a really steep learning curve. That's what I'm good at is is gathering information and, and onboarding it really quite quickly. What I know about myself is it's that last 10% of learning, like of sheer mastery that I find particularly effortful. Um, where my skill set is, is actually bringing all sorts of different areas together and, and shining a different light on a problem. Um, and the MBA was just so incredibly helpful for that. Um, you know, I, I had people on my course that had, that had never watched a game of tennis before, um, uh, but were mathematical whizzes. Like it was, it was quite extraordinary. And you, you kind of think that everyone knows sport, but what I did realize, Rob, was that um, that's just my world and our world. And the reality is, if you add in all the revenues for the big four sports in America, so yeah, yeah, NFLs, NBAs, um, Major League Baseball, and um, and hockey, total revenues in a year is about the same as the total revenues of the cardboard box industry. <laughs> so there's a whole world out there. Um, and that's kind of why, why I did it. Like I, I started off um, part-time and, and actually really enjoyed it and then thought, oh, I'm going to have a proper crack at this. So do you think that people would benefit from something like that who are still full-time athlete facing? Or do you think that is something too far removed for them to get transfer there? Interesting question. I think it like everyone's context is so individual. So I, I, I couldn't speak generically. Um, most people that go into an MBA do so because they want a, tra- a career transition or to help with their, um, with, with, in their job. Um, so if you're wanting a career transition, it is actually a really good thing to do. Um, if you wanted to help your job, I would say it doesn't really help you prepare athletes. But if you're in a leadership role, it actually is really helpful. Um, and so I am a real advocate of it, but there's a huge opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is it's bloody expensive um, and it's hugely time consuming. Um, 
And so other alternatives are out there. And I think it's really important to, to look at that. So um, it was really good for me, but not everyone would experience the, the same sort of outcomes uh, or, or get the same sort of inputs that I did. I want to dive into the chapter that you guys did and around dealing with the modern athlete. Why did you... There's so much going on with the book. Obviously, pulling authors in, dealing with all the stuff you're dealing with, timeframes, etc. Why did you want to do a chapter on this yourself? Dan, I'm coming to you on that one. Um, <clears throat> are, we, are we talking the retraining chapter? Is in the, the rehab chapter? Or are we talking the bit at the beginning? The bit at the beginning, yeah. Thanks. Um, well, I guess, yeah... We did a similar thing for the first book, and I guess it, you know, it's partly around framing why have we done the book, you know, who's it for, how, how's it going to be, how's it going to come across to you, what, how do you use the book effectively? Um, but I think this this particular book, in terms of when we wrote the introduction, um, it was obviously, I believe, Joyce, it, uh, this kind of cusp of COVID, wasn't it? It was around the start of COVID, give or take, when we wrote the introduction. Yeah, there was there was COVID. There was there was bushfires in Australia. The world, yeah, all that sort of stuff that was going on. Yeah, so I think it, you know, standing on a slight soapbox for a minute, it, it is definitely an opportunity to kind of talk to the heart almost about what's going on in the world. And there's a reality within sport that sport is becoming, as I'm sure we'll talk later, you know, more complex than it used to be. There's there's more at stake, arguably, than there used to be, and it's 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 more of a challenging and diverse environment than it has ever been. But I think if you put that in the context of the kind of global world that we now live in and the challenges we have and we're going to have, be it through COVID or similar or changes which are inevitable now to our environment and how that changes people's perception of sport, um, their, I guess their, their interface with sport and what they want to see from a sport, um, challenges around how people will be able to travel the globe potentially, um, the sustainability of sport generally. I think there's 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 a lot of kind of life going on, as Joyce said, out there instead of sport and, and you know as well as sport. So I think for me it was an opportunity to kind of um, yeah talk to the heart about the world more broadly and what's coming up. And if you can dive into it, so there's a few there's a few lines in there around I guess the changes of medical science that we can expect in the next five, ten, fifteen years, which is going to accelerate the ability to be remotely effective potentially. Uh, and it's going to open up doors for some and it's going to make it more challenging for others uh, and certainly make it more complex. But yeah, I guess for me, it was an opportunity to to kind of tie together um, some of the global events that have been going on and will continue to go on and how that might have impact on sport. And probably just to add on to that, Rob, is the to give an answer to the question that you asked right at the beginning, which was why do a second edition? And, and, you know, really what we wanted to do was um, say, well, there's actually, um, there's actually 16 new chapters. And what we wanted to do was go, right, well, it's not just a, a slight iteration of that. It's fundamentally a new book. And what we've tried to do is, is tie a lot of it all together. Um, and I, Dan, Dan spoke really well about that early on. And I think the, um, the bit about understanding the modern athlete and and our role in that ecosystem is what we wanted to get out of that bit as well we'll dive into that in a second dan just coming back onto your point of advances and you mentioned their medical science and it's going to be better for some more challenging for others can you give us an insight into that for those that haven't read the book it might obviously we're going to be dying to Oh, well, I guess um, at a really high level, if we look at the way that um, interactions between athletes and medical practitioners currently occur. So if you, one small example is if you want to see the best surgeon currently, you, you travel as far as it takes to get you to meet that surgeon, you know, shake them by the hand, they tell you what's going to happen, and then you're under the knife potentially for a procedure. And it's not beyond the realms of um, imagination that in five to 10 years time, that same surgeon could be operating on you remotely, you know, without needing to meet you. Um, I think that's something which is, is being talked about and will become a reality to whatever level over time. Um, and what that does, I guess, is it, it globalizes medical science, doesn't it? So if we look at the impact of social media now, any athlete can pretty much be interacted with and interact with anyone around the globe, which opens, you know, enormous 
opportunities and possibilities for practitioners, people, athletes to engage on a level that they've they've not done previously. Um, and I guess within the medical sphere and medical space, in terms of things like yeah procedures, surgical procedures, in terms of things like remote um, monitoring, assessments, I think that the, the world will open up. So it doesn't you know you won't need to travel the thousands of miles that currently perhaps you do to meet that right person to work on you in that way. Um, so I think that's that's one small example, I guess, of where medical science is probably going over the next five to ten years. The surgical example is just mental. Absolutely wild, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's adverts on it already. It has been for a couple of years. I suppose advertising 5G and all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, when you when you actually bring it to life, yeah, crazy stuff. It's madness. But Joyce, it? it's crazy. Isn't it? Joyce, just coming back to you, and I'd love to get your take on this because you guys have probably straddled an era in sport that has and tell me wrong if please tell me if i'm wrong in this the like ultra professionalization of elite sport i mean i was in a league one club slash championship club as a as a player in 2004 and there were still players coming on a sunday for a recovery session in the kit that they went out on the saturday night and no one really asked any questions because it was just a done thing. And you hear about it all, on the TV all the time from ex players. To now, which is only, f- what, 16, 17 years later, that is, from what I understand, is just would never, ever, ever happen anymore. So you guys have probably straddled, like I say, straddled that professionalization. But from athlete personality point of view, what has changed in that time from when you guys started out to what? you see now in athletes i think what we're seeing now much more than at any other time is the athlete as a brand and you know uh, there's a lot of athletes in the u.s increasingly in europe um that turn up for match days and for training and then leave and they will have they will outsource all their medical care or their extra training to a really small cadre of, of trusted supporters or trusted experts that, that travel with them. Um, and so the, the performance support team is really fragmented now. Um, in, in many, many instances, you go to Real Madrid, you go to, to Liverpool, you go to you know just about all the NFL clubs. And in, on top of that, the player collective bargaining agreements is getting you know much meatier. They've got a lot more teeth um, and there is a lot less time required at the club, which means there's more time away from the club, but the expectations on the players are still sky high. So they know that they have to be in peak condition, um, which is built what... I would say a cottage industry, it's cottage at the moment, but it's actually going to be a really big industry over the next five, 10 years, I think, of people providing performance support services to three athletes. Um, what do you think about that, Danny? You, you probably see that more than I do with tennis. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I guess um, working at team sport where I was five or six years ago, there, there was a, there was the start of this. So within within the England rugby set of obviously we, you know, you collect players for international periods in which you you work with them and then they work through their club staff um, when they're back of their clubs. Um, but there's no doubt during the time I was there, there were some players who had their own uh, individual physios or individual, I guess, performance support staff that they work with as well. Um, but I wasn't very, I wasn't hugely aware of it. You know, there was a couple of incidences. I wouldn't say it was widespread. But clearly, as Joyce has said, I think the football world is slightly ahead of that. And maybe maybe five, six years ago, that was certainly you know common practice within football. Um, I think my experience is in tennis. Tennis is, in some regards, some way ahead of other sports in terms of this, this um, branding or you know um, commercialism of the athlete or self-commercialism of the athlete by the athlete. Um, and certainly within tennis now, you know, it's an individual sport anyway. And the way, as I said to you before when I spoke to you, the way that um, our organisation runs is we work with some individual athletes and we work in support of some athletes and their teams. 
Um, but there's no doubt, you know, if we look at the external influences that um, a modern tennis player has, you know, they may have one or two agents. They're certainly going to have personal staff working with them. Um, there's certainly going to be a great deal more um, social media thought in terms of their lives and the way that they make decisions because they are a business. Um, and I think, as Joyce has said, team sports, it would definitely seem are heading in that way as well. And as, as the money goes up and the expectation remains or goes up even further, you know, you, you can see that happening, can't you? So, yeah, I'd, I'd really agree with um, those observations. And it was probably clandestine to start with, like it was done on the sly that you'd go and see another physio. But I think looking, you know, not too far in the, into the future, that will be the... Uh, that will be the expectation. Is is this going to be a detriment to the club staff? Could club staff start shrinking as players go off and do their own thing? Or could that be, could there be a, just a stronger link between the club staff and these external practitioners? Uh, yeah, I guess for me, I, I can't really say whether that's going to have a massive impact on club teams in terms of how they organise themselves. But I definitely think that for performance support to be effective, you know, it needs to be integrated. So the the language, decision making and communication that the individual practitioners are having with that athlete on a one to one level, they need to be aligned to what's being said at a club level. Otherwise, there's disharmony and distrust straight away. So and you, and you see that already now and, and historically when people make unilateral decisions in their silo, which aren't conveyed across and discussed openly, you know, it creates, it creates challenges all over the place. So I think in terms of optimizing performance, which is ultimately, you know, what we're all talking about as a focus, um, it's crucial that communication is really, really strong. And it might be Rob that, um, the, the clubs have their own, you know, their head count doesn't change too much, but it will be one person's role will be coordinating all the other satellite teams to make sure that the information is being gathered, disseminated, all those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it, that actually came up in uh, an article that was written on Sportsmith last couple of weeks that I was speaking to Joycey about before you popped on, Dan. Um, and one example was, was Tom King, who left Liverpool, first team training conditioning coach and I'm sure you won't have any problem with me saying this because it's all in the, in the article itself but was just frustrated with the lack of time that he had with players and that led to him leaving and, and potentially working with a couple of those players plus creating a business out of this to actually have some proper focused one-on-one -on -one time with the players in his care and that came across as uh, in, in the three or four people that were interviewed for the article um, and a similar frustrations. How can I get more time with these guys or girls? Well, I can't. So I'm gonna have to think of something else. Like think of another model that can um, that can give me that, but also give the athletes more of what they deserve. So yeah, I'm, I think it'll just be a um, something that flourishes. And not only like you hear a couple of years ago, it was like Ronaldo's doing it, but no, 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 like. It's filtering down. It will continue to filter down. It won't go behind the scenes. It'll be, it'll be front facing. So, from an athlete perspective, and we spoke about it a little bit there, what are the expectations of athletes on you guys, Dan, on the the heads of, on the practitioners who are with them more recently versus when you started out? Um. I, well, I guess. Uh, when when I started out, and I'm going to sound like my dad now, you know, um, <laughs> think it was a far simpler world. So starting out in sport for me, uh, at Northampton Rugby Club, I think there was myself and another physio and one S and C coach operating across a squad size of you know 35, 40 people. Um, pretty pretty simple. Um, and obviously, if you transpose that to now, we in terms of the amount of domain specific expertise you've got, it wouldn't be unfamiliar to have one or two doctors three to four physios three to four snc coaches a nutritionist a, a podiatrist on call a biomechanist a physiologist you know go on and on and on so i think the um the diversity of domain specialism has gone through the roof uh, within sport broadly um i guess in terms of the expectations the athletes have on on you the practitioner um Again, having stepped out of it now for five years or so and not, and not being at the coalface, 
I guess I need to be careful kind of how I how I answer that but I guess f- from observation from my experience ultimately I guess the players are perhaps more worldly than they used to be um, have access as I said before to other op- opportunities and options in terms of people in terms of domains so in a medical space there might just be a physio historically but now there's an osteopath a chiropractor you know some kind of crazy witch doctor there's there's a whole harem of different domains within that same medical box um, and I guess as a young impressionable athlete in any sport looking on social media and seeing your favorite player or your favorite athlete undergo some kind of crazy far-fetched therapy might propagate a feeling that that would benefit you as well so I think there's in terms of expectations yeah the players now are more more worldly have access to more options opportunities and can quite readily see through the window of what others are doing um, and that might change their expectations and perceptions on what they need. Um, I think behind that, from my perspective, it's the same deal. You know, ultimately, these are people who are hopefully highly intrinsically motivated, you know, desperate to get better um, and looking at every opportunity they can to do so. And therefore working with you in a way, be it medically or physically, to maximise their potential. What was that like for you, Joycey, over there in your last role? expectations of athletes on you and your team um well expectations are really high but that's that's by no means unique to our environment or our city or our country that's just elite sport um what i if i try and chart the last even 10 years rob i would say that um players and athletes have become um, more savvy um, in knowing what their rights are, which is you know one of the great um, shifts in in sport over the last decade. I would say there's been a much greater emphasis on on well being and and mental health, mental performance, um, which another which is another you know great leap forward for us. But at the same time, I think because of the propagation of social media and and alternative facts and things like that, there is um, there is opportunity for people to weasel their way into an athlete's inner circle without actually being purveyors of of high quality information or high quality um, treatment or, or programming or, or whatever it is. So there's always going to be the need for people to help athletes fact check and to, to make the right decisions that, and that's critical because athletes will just do whatever they can to be ready for the next week or to maximize their career or whatever. Um, and they don't always have the, um, the appropriate skill set or expertise or experience to make those decisions. So they're always going to need trusted people in, in Dan's role to provide that sort of filter for them. So I don't think that's changed. In fact, I think that role has become increasingly more important. So how it's a delicate balance because you've got these highly paid guys and girls potentially with entourage around them been influenced by other people like them influenced by social media influenced by everything but you're the the kind of mainstay at the club or the organization in, in in your instance now dan how do you go about that how do you go about being sympathetic to their want to get better and look for outside influence to try to do that but also go, mm, don't think that's really right for you, even though you've potentially got all these other people around you saying, yes, go for it, do it. That's a delicate balance because you obviously can't lose the athlete and or lose the player. So how do you go how do you go about that, Dan? It's tricky, mate, honestly. Um and I guess um for, from my perspective, ultimately, you know, within the context of my role, we we we're, we're trying to empower young people to become outstanding tennis players. And we're operating in a decentralised system, so we don't we don't have the right, nor should we, to tell them what to do. Um, what we do represent, as you kind of touched on there, is, is we're consistent, 
And I think the, the strength you have as an organisation is to be someone who is consistently there for the player and the athlete on their, on their journey um, and consistent in your behaviours and in your interactions as well. And I think um, certainly in, in tennis is one example. The average turnover for a coach and player is something like 18 months. You know, it's a very, very um, or relatively short period of time. It's hugely intense. You know, and you can quite explain why it is so short, I think, in that regard. Um, but there's this constant flux within within their their world, even when they're super successful. Um, and I think being able to be the consistent kind of background um, support for that as the safety net, if you like, I think there's real merits in that. And that's how you build, I guess, long-term trust as well. Um, and I think equally, as I probably said in the last um time we talked about this there's a lot of getting out of your own way so you know there's there's a lot of making sure that you are open to um, the player and athlete's perspective and perception of what is going to make them better because ultimately it is all on them you know when the lights go on it's it's on them not on you so I think that you need to be constantly open and welcoming to other people other ideas um, and then I think the as I say the consistency area is is the interface between best practice and your knowledge of best practice but delivering it in the right way and it's these these are all kind of really easy words to say and I think the reality is it can be really tricky but from my perspective getting better at it and I need to still get better at it um, has been all about being more self-aware parking my ego at the door being genuinely open to what it is that people feel will make them better and how it will work and being really consistent you know whether they whether they like you or loathe you, whether they choose you or choose something else, at the end of the day, staying consistent um, is, is, is the way that I, I think long term will do the best by the athlete. Um, but as I say, it's easy to, easy to say, it is really, really hard to do and it can be very challenging. And there are certainly times where I've had to speak my mind and say that I don't believe that this is going to help you or this group or this team. Uh, and these are the reasons why. But I'm not emotionally invested in it when I'm at my best, you know, so I can I can give the facts, give an opinion, but not be beholden to whether they choose me and select me or select something else. What was your reckon, experience that, Josie? Well, I was just going to build on what Dan said He, um, in that I think the big shift for me over, you know, the journey was go- thinking about best practice and I'm going to implement best practice. Um and actually, in most of what we do, there's no best practice. There's just versions of good practice, and then there's not so good practice. Um, if we get stuck on best practice, and I know best practice, then anyone who doesn't do what I do is not doing best practice. Therefore, they have to be wrong. Whereas if you have a mindset of what I think is good practice, but there are other good practices around you can then enter the the conversation in a real problem solving kind of mindset as well. And um, I think early on in my career, I was probably a little bit too adversarial, you know, because I thought I had best practice because that's what I read in the papers and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I I now, as much as I can, as much as I, I remember to, um, try and solve the problem by thinking about the other person is not the problem. There's The other person is still trying to solve the problem. They're just looking at it from a different angle. And I need to know what angle they're looking at it from. And they need to know what angle I'm looking at it from. And then we negotiate what is a joint best practice. Um, knowing that, you know, there are compromises often on both sides. But as Dan said, it's you're playing a long game and it's it's very much a relationship build here. And if you if you dig your heels on it in on every matter, you don't last very long. One thing you mentioned, Joyce, and it was the the psychological, mental health, well being side of things, which is come to the fore and Dan's in a perfect position to talk about this given the tennis, the obvious tennis um examples but do you think from from your experience in previous roles that elite sport and elite teams and elite organizations whatever that may be whether that be business or or sport are actually set up to deal with it as it is now because or or do you think that again looking at athlete expectations or employee expectations 
are actually further ahead than what organizations are uh, set up to to cope with around this mental health well-being yeah. scenario yeah i think that's fair but i am optimistic about it rob um if if we go back say 30 years um the prevailing uh, training methodology was to get good at your sport. So if you're a runner, you run more. If you're a, a a cricketer, you play, you get in the nets more. And then what happened was we started to see strength and conditioning come in. And the people that partook in strength and conditioning were able to apply their skills for longer with less decay. They got less injured, all those sorts of things. And bit by bit, you know, that started to th- throw flow through our industry and now it is just an accepted part. Everyone does it. Every, as Dan said, you know, clubs will have three to four, oftentimes more strength and conditioners on staff because it is just part of the furniture. It is if you're starting a if you're starting a football club from day one, you have strength and conditioners as you know some of the first people on your staff roster. Um, I think where we're at with mental skills, mental performance, mental health is where we were at with strength and conditioning 30 years ago. There's a real recognition that it is helpful and it is just going to explode. You know, I'm in full, full transparency. I, I work with a, with a mental performance um, business. We're, we're trying to, to make this accessible and affordable to everyone in the world um, because we see that's where the gaps are but they don't stay gaps for long. Like that, this is going to proliferate and and be a real source of competitive, uh, competitive edge for for people. I think um, the gains there are still gains, and there were always going to be gains to be had by having strength and conditioning and um, and and expert sports medicine. Like that, that will never decrease in relevance. Never. Um, but what will increase is mental performance and mental skills and mental health. And I would expect in, in addition three of, of high performance trainings for sports. Um, I see the look on Dan's face. Um, um, like we, we will, we will almost certainly have more than one chapter on this. Dan, I'm going to throw that to you as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Joyce. So I think, you know, again, tennis is completely different to rugby. When I left Rugby Union, there wasn't much talk around mental health, you know, five years ago. Um, but equally, if you compare those two ecosystems, you know, in rugby, you've got 14 of the lads around you on those kind of biggest stages to draw upon each other, both within the match and outside of the match. Um and, and perhaps it wasn't talked about as much within rugby, perhaps back then, and perhaps it is it's far more um, available and accepted now, should we say. Um, but tennis, as I say, is, is a very different animal. You know, you walk out there on your own in front of, you know, thousands of people with millions watching. Um, the pressure and expectation is very, very high and, and you are doing it all yourself. I mean, I must say one of the things that... Um, I've really enjoyed about working at the LTA and within British tennis is the kind of genuine person first mentality. Um, partly because you are with developing young people through a pathway, but partly because there's a genuine acknowledgement that that really is, you know, very, very important. And in terms of driving long term and sustainable, sustainable success, having that kind of mentality about the work you have at a practitioner level with your player or that we have as a system around the player and the players is critical you know it is it does make a big big difference um one of the chaps who wrote in the book uh, dr james bell actually works for the lta um and yeah the, the the work he and the team have done around our group is is fantastic you know and again it, it comes down to understanding the significance of the challenges that you face day to day in competition and making sure you proceed that or wrap around that the right amount of support personal support um and there's no ground, you know, I mean, again, the, the former performance director at the LTA before Michael was Simon Timpson. Um, and he, he would talk about that, you know, very emotively, you know, in terms of, um, you know, he- healthy, happy people make great performers, you know, and it's, there's a real, there is, as Joyce said, a real edge to this in terms of performance sport. Um, 
and the sustainability of the athlete within their sport. Um, but I think moreover, you know, that the, the holistic model of support that we wrap around people is paramount, given the pressures that they're under and the things that go on behind the scenes and the complexity of the world that they have, the family, family circumstances, personal circumstances, the expectations on them as a performer. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. So it'd be fair to say... To- It'd be oh, fair God, to say that, sorry, sorry, Rob, it'd be fair to say that your psychology impacts on your physiology and, and, and vice versa, Dan, would you say? So you can't, Definitely. what, what, what we're saying is that this, um, you can't tease them apart. That then we, we put them in chapters for a reason because that's just the way you write books. And we haven't discovered a real, really great way to put it all together. But the reality is they're all interlinked and intertwined and, and there's, they're separate but inseparable, I would say. How do you do that on a daily basis, Dan? How how did the the likes of Dr. James Bell provide that support given the challenges of the decentralized program that you, that you described earlier? Yeah, so I guess um, the, the the way that he and his team operate with it within our space is that we have, I guess, a number of distinct programs along the pathway that we operate within. Uh, be it men's and women's programs or pathway programs, etc. Um, we then have some or, or quite a heavy amount of bias towards our education and coach and practitioner development work, which is more about the system. So it's more about understanding the network of people that work within it at a practitioner level, coaching level, you know, the, the family that are around these players and making sure that they're given um, the best possible resources and advice and education around this kind of stuff. So I think it's it's multimodal. So I think there's, there's certainly work that uh, James and his team will do at an individual level with players. And that could be performance biased. It could be far more um, mental health biased in terms of wh- where that is. Although, again, that is definitely a continuum and, and the same thing. Um, but then I guess, moreover, working with coaches who operate with a number of players or working with practitioners who work with a number of players um, at a system level to understand how how they can engage, look for early warning signs, coach and operate around their players, raise a flag when something's wrong and talk to the right people. Um, it's, it's about setting up structures and systems, I guess, um, to support them as well. Cool, thanks, mate. Just coming back to you, Joycey, one thing you mentioned, this is one of the final points I'll make before I let you, ta- let you guys get on with your day. Athletes are brands. They're a brand within themselves. Should it be the strength and conditioning coach, the physio, the sports scientist? Should it be in their remit to try to help these brands, the multiple multiple brands that are walking around their training facility, to help them do what they do outside and help them manage that? Or should it be strictly, I'm here to help you when you're here and physically, mentally, emotionally, and the brand stuff kind of takes care of itself and that's your manager that's your i don't know agent social media executive whatever it may be what's your thoughts around that because i'm guessing that five or ten years ago when this was starting to come in it was almost a bit of a a hindrance and an annoyance that all this stuff was going on around the athlete is it now we need to embrace this we need to help them in all aspects of their life hmm I don't think I've ever really considered it, Rob. To be honest, okay. so certainly not in certainly not in those terms. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think there's an element of, um, you know, let the painters paint. So okay. if yeah. if um, you know, I don't think it's the strength and conditioner's role to help the brand of the player in a in a pure marketing or branding sense. And I'm going to answer a slightly different question. Um, I think it is really important that the strength and conditioning coaches and the physios and the medical staff, et cetera, do actually understand the pressures that the players are under from a number of different aspects. So it's not, we used to, I still think that the term overtraining is wrong because we just think that the reason someone falls over is because we've trained them too hard. But the reality is it's just an overstress thing. And that stress can be schooling, relationship, financial, branding, whatever it is. Um, so the really smart 
operators can understand the world through other people's eyes. So, yeah, but I, but I also think that it is the job of the strength and conditioning coach to work with the player on their, their fundamental one wood, which is getting them strong and fit. Um, so I, I wouldn't be going too divergent from that, but certainly having an appreciation for all the other aspects. Dan's probably going to give a much more intelligent and coherent answer than I am. No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> well, as, as Joyce said, you've got to understand the context. You've got to understand the context of the individual. And if you want to make them stronger, fitter, faster, more healthy, that as, as Dave quite nicely said earlier, these things are intertwined. And the, and the more contextual understanding you have around that person, what's happening for them, what's on their mind, um, I think implicitly that that is the kind of, they're the qualities that good S&C coaches, physios and practitioners have naturally. Um, but it is pretty critical that, yeah, you understand the whole picture. If you're going to try and make the biggest change um, and understand when to push, when to pull, you know, when you're going to rein back, when you're really going to chase this, um, is, is to a degree dependent on understanding what else is going on, not just what match is coming up. So I think, um, yeah, the, the worlds are getting more intertwined than they've ever been. I think the divide between, as you say, the performer and the, the brand is closer than it's ever been. And will get closer in terms of how people make individual decisions and what they put around themselves and um, their own journeys as athletes. Um, but I think ultimately, coming back to fundamentals, the SNC coach is accountable or responsible for making that athlete stronger, fitter, faster. Um, but to do that effectively, they need to understand the context. Yeah. You've answered the question that I was add in my head that didn't break come across as I asked you and Josie so thank you for interpreting my nonsense <laughs> cool well just to wrap up I want to make sure that people know given the popularity of high performance training for sports one where people can get access to high performance training for sports two Joycey where is the best place for people to go uh, well I think most most people would have heard of Amazon and that seems to to do a pretty good job of delivering books to people. Um but obviously so there's there's all all bookstores it should be available in in all bookstores hopefully. So um and you know with the Human Kinetics website as well uh, I think they do a really good job and they've got really good stocks in Europe at the moment. So um if that's where you are do so Booktopia in Australia Amazon US and and hopefully so I think we I think we got it in five languages six languages last time something like that so um we're we're looking to expand that as well so I think that the one thing I would really like um out of this one is to expand the audience to include coaches like technical coaches as well um so that the job of the coach now is is increasingly broad and they need to be able to have um, conversations and be able to speak a number of different languages. And I think what we, what um, Dan and I have tried to do in this book is be able to, to make some pretty complex and complicated subjects um, digestible. And we've done that through the selection of the authors who have done a magnificent job absolutely magnificent job to do that so i think it's it's more accessible than ever so we're we're looking forward to to um people getting it and reading it and 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 giving us feedback as well so thanks for, thanks very much for having us rob pleasure and people can get it worldwide now it's available everywhere yeah i believe so i okay. believe so cool cool and where can people follow you guys social media um, wise I was going to say, well, I, I'm entering uh, month four of lockdown, so you can... <laughs> Not you follow can, you anywhere. <laughs> you, can, you can't follow me anywhere. Um, yeah, so 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 Twitter, at David G. Joyce, um, and LinkedIn, and, and, you know, happy to answer emails and the like, so... Cool. Dan? Uh, similar, mate. So, at Dan Lewenden for Twitter, LinkedIn somewhere. As a shiny bald head, you'll find it. Um, email danlunden at me.com. Yeah, always always up for a chat. Lovely. It's been a pleasure to have you both. Good luck with the book. I'm sure it'll absolutely fly. And uh, look forward to catching up soon. 
Good on you, Rob. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you.